Good morning, everyone. Thank you for coming to the Middle East Institute, not our building, but our event. Um, I'd like to thank all our guests who have come from far away, our speakers. Uh, we're very happy to have uh, this conference on Saudi Arabia, with essentially the top talent in the world on Saudi Arabia, coming here to share your views with us. I'm uh, grateful to Dr. Uh, Madawi Arashi for putting together this uh, event. I think that uh, we have a lot of work in front of us in the sense that uh, Saudi is going through momentous changes. Uh, you've had effectively a demographic transition, not only at the level of the populace, but at the level of the top leadership. Something hugely new. You have Saudi Arabia uh, having uh, had a big scare with the fall of Mubarak and so on, now turning 180 degrees in its foreign policy. <coughs> not just uh, checkbook diplomacy, but actual uh, guns out there. Uh, um, very forward-leaning uh, forward uh, military policy. That's something very new. You have the potential uh, IPOization of uh, Saudi Aramco, something also hugely new. This has always been essentially, um, you could say, pre uh, So we have a lot of uh, challenges ahead of us. Not to, make, not to forget also the uh, question of whether the U.S. is uh, on holiday from the Middle East or going back, um, which has made, uh, I think, being part of this uh, uh, stepping up the plate of uh, doing things yourself for the Gulf and uh, Saudi. So we have many challenges uh, ahead of us. Uh, and I would make a plug uh, sitting in Singapore for saying that um, if uh, people in Saudi Arabia and the rest of the Middle East were to maybe not 100%, but 10% of the time look east instead of look west, they would find a whole new range of uh, possibilities and variables to uh, play with, which would uh, essentially, um, in the long term, change the parameters, their operating, basic operating parameters, which uh, at the moment are rather stuck uh, within uh, narrow bounds. So with that, I'll just stop and uh, have a professor more than we did. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Nice to see you all here with us in Singapore. Um, I'd like to welcome you and also thank you for making the journey to Singapore at a very busy time in the academic calendar. Um, in addition to participating in this conference, the reason for you to be here, I, would, I hope that you get a chance to visit this magnificent city. For those of us who work on the Middle East, I must say being here for a year now was an eye-opening experience. From its architecture, to its diverse people, Singapore offers us um, a window of opportunity to look at how communities, races, religions, and people coexist, interact, and sometimes laugh at each other. Um, being here in Singapore and holding a conference on Saudi Arabia makes me think that it is time for us social scientists and historians to decenter our intellectual frame, uh, frame of mind. Being here allows you to question some of the assumptions that we learned as graduate students. One of them, I would say, is the famous or infamous Weberian model of the Protestant ethic and the spirit of capitalism. You could see here some amazing things that I hope you will get a chance to see them um, after the conference and enjoy the city. So why hold the conference in Singapore about Saudi Arabia? As mentioned by Professor uh, Eng Seng Ho, the connections between Arabia, the Middle East in general, from Morocco uh, eastward are long lasting. It's not all about trade and oil. It's about people, about communities, about genealogies, about also Islam. Uh, we think in the Middle East that we are at the center of it all. 
Obviously, if you grew up in Saudi Arabia, you would think that you are at the center of the universe of Islam, the world of Islam. But being here in Singapore allows us to see Islam from a different perspective. So the connections between this part of the world and the Middle East are long lasting. Not to mention the pilgrims who every year make the journey from this part of the world and visit uh, Saudi Arabia. From traders, scholars, pilgrims, to workers, intellectuals, we find that the connections are so great and these regions have actually had a long history of interactions. There are communities from this part of the world living at the doorsteps of the Haram Sharif, and there are people from that part of the world living here. So let me now move, uh, after justifying holding this conference in Singapore, um, I would like to say a few words about uh, Saudi Arabia. Uh, since its creation in 1932, Saudi Arabia continues to divide opinions. Among analysts and scholars, speculations about its resilience or imminent collapse um, are abundant. But so far, the regime seems to hold on to power amidst two contradictory narratives. At one end, there's the narrative that, they, uh, uh, that highlights its resilience and ability to contain shock and challenges at different historical moments. In contrast, the opposite, at the opposite end, there is the story of the imminent collapse of the House of Saud. And even today, we hear uh, arguments about the fragmentation of the kingdom into smaller entities um, along sectarian, regional, and tribal lines. But the truth about Saudi Arabia lies um, in between these two extreme narratives. The triumphalist tone of the first one needs to be assessed against the wishful thinking sometimes that underlies speculations about its imminent collapse. In both narratives, I remember a British scholar who is very close to Saudi Arabia, has written a couple of books about the country, said as one uh, about Saudi Arabia is one of the planets enduring and for some quiet offensive enigmas. This conference is an attempt to unravel the enigma and assess the real challenges that Saudi Arabia faced and continues to face, especially after the Arab uprising. Based on new research that moves beyond the two opposed narratives, the conference participants will engage with Saudi history, contemporary trajectories, and foreign relations. Their rich and nuanced studies offer us a balanced understanding of the country and sophisticated interpretations of its domestic, regional, and international choices that may appear to outsiders as shrouded in secrecy and opaqueness. Several contributors in this conference engage in diachronic analysis that uncover the recent past, but also identify continuities and discontinuities emerging from both the leadership and societal changes. Before we start this conference, first I would like to uh, thank profusely uh, the Middle East Institute at the National University of Singapore and its amazing and energetic people. Professor Peter Slaglet and Michelle Thiel, support from the very beginning was boundless. Without their encouragement, this conference would not have happened. I also would like to thank Professor Eng Seng Ho, who joined us in uh, June, for his continuous support and fresh insights into the uh, uh, topics we will be discussing. My final thanks are for Huda, Sharifa Huda Al Junaid, uh, whose name attests to the ancient connections that we uh, actually uh, uh, cherish between Arabia and East Asia. Uh, her, her creative and talented team were responsible for bringing you here and looking after you in Singapore. I would like also to mention Zubaida, Retna, Romel, Ed Ismail, and Edison, and the others who have made this conference possible. Please join me in thanking them all. I would like now to invite Professor Gregory Goes to deliver the keynote speech.
clap. You haven't heard it yet. <laughs> uh, I'm very, very uh, grateful to Dr. Nagawi <coughs> Al-Bashid and Professor Ensign Ho and the staff of the Middle East Institute at the National University for this singular honor of being able to keynote this conference. Uh, but I also ha have a little trepidation because as I look out, I see younger colleagues, fresh from the field, fresh from the archives. And I recall uh, when I was sitting out there and other people were up here, how, how little I thought of the keynoters. Uh, you know, old guys, gas bags, living off their reputations. Uh, the only thing I'll say to my younger colleagues is uh, be kind because your, your, your time is coming. <laughs> I want to talk today about the, the, that space in between the two narratives that Madawi mentioned in her framing uh, and talk about how I see the regime security strategy that the Al Saud have formulated to keep themselves in power to, to, to have been so successful over the past decades in maintaining themselves in an area of the world where regime security is, uh, at least at least in terms of recent history, been uh, tenuous. Uh, and then ask the question, uh, are the Al Saud reconstituting or rethinking that regime security strategy? So the success of the, of the Saudi regime in weathering the storms of the Middle East over the past six decades and remaining in power is based, I think, on three important domestic political factors. First, an oil-funded, patronage-based system that links important constituencies to the ruling elite while keeping those constituencies divided from each other. Two, a strong relationship with the religious establishment that provides both legitimation ideologically and support from an important social constituency. And three, cohesion within the ruling family itself. At the international level, the Saudi regime's relationship with the United States is a problematic but important element of the regime's security strategy, at times creating problems at home but providing a security umbrella in a fractious region. Now, it is possible, and I stress the word possible, that each of these pillars of regime stability could be undergoing change, and that the Saudi leadership is recalculating its regime security strategy. Now, I conclude that the Al Saud are likely to survive the current round of domestic and regional crises, as they have past rounds. But I do try to identify areas where I think if the Al Saud are recalculating their regime security strategy, it could lead to problems for them. So let's consider for one moment the question that, that uh, Dr. al started our, our deliberations with, and that is this unusual obsession among scholars in the West with the stability of this regime. For most political scientists, explaining the stability of a regime that has been stable is not an interesting question. No one writes books about the stability of Britain or the stability of the United States, although after our recent election, perhaps such books might be in order. Uh, but the longevity of the Al Saud remains a mystery to Western observers. Its demise has been foretold by generations of students of the region. Each regional crisis <coughs> was seen as the last straw that was finally going to break the back of this political anachronism. Nasserist Pan-Arabism, the Islamic Revolution in Iran, the heightened global scrutiny following the September 11, 2001 attacks by Al-Qaeda on the United States, the Arab uprisings of 2011, and most recently, the collapse of oil prices in late 2014, have all been identified as the death knell of political stability in a country, in the country of Saudi Arabia. Let me just give you a couple of titles of recent publications to give you a flavor. Saudi Arabia, a kingdom in peril. The specter of Saudi instability. It is time for the United States to start worrying about a Saudi collapse. These are all recent publications in the last two years. 
Christopher Davidson of Durham University in his book, After the Shafts, The Coming Collapse of the Gulf Monarchies, had the courage to make a point prediction that the Al Saud and the other monarchical families on the Arab side of the Persian Gulf would fall by the end of 2017. The jury remains out, but the clock is ticking. Now the point here is not to disparage or denigrate this work. Much can be learned from it. We still look to uh, Fred Halliday's book, Arabia Without Sultans, to learn about Arabian politics in the 1970s, even though the sultans and the kings and the emirs are still there. It's only to call into question the assumptions, stated and unstated, that the authors make about the underpinnings of Saudi regime stability. Now, those who seek to explain the underpinnings of that stability can be as wrong as those who forecast the regime's demise. In the wake of the Arab uprisings, a number of analysts sought to explain the stability of the monarchical regimes by the nature or the legitimacy, and I put that term in quotes, of the regime type itself. Right? But monarchs have no special mandate to rule in the Arab world. They have fallen in as many Arab countries since World War II as they have survived. If one extends the analysis to the greater Middle East, the fallen monarchs of Iran and Afghanistan can be added. There is, no particular, there is no particular cultural affinity, even in Arabian society, for monarchy either. The imams of North Yemen were no less Arabian and no less legitimate than the rulers of the rest of Arabia and could claim a much longer historical pedigree. Yet the imamate has, dis has disappeared from history. The sheikhs and sultans that ruled the small states making up the South Arabian Federation, British protectorates that, along with the Crown Colony of Aden, became South Yemen, resembled the sheikhs of the United Arab Emirates in everything but the possession of oil. In short, those who seek to explain regime stability in Saudi Arabia and the other Gulf monarchies through some kind of imagined cultural legitimacy, I think, have failed to make their case. When we consider the stability of regimes, we can't do it in the abstract. Each regime builds its own particular strategy for survival based on specific institutions and partnerships with its society and with international actors. And those strategies change over time as regimes acquire new resources and deal with new challenges. In, our, in Saudi Arabia, since the 1970s, that survival strategy is based first and foremost upon oil wealth. Oil does not automatically guarantee regime security. If it did, the son of the late Shah of Iran would be consulting with his royal courtiers in Tehran about how to deal with Saddam Hussein. That's a joke. <laughs> but oil wealth does give rulers the ability to build institutions and to form social alliances aimed at maintaining their rule. Now, every regime does this, of course, but oil wealth means you don't have to make the hard choices. Right? The trade-offs are less extreme and less acute. One element of the oil-based political economy built by the al Saud's is the broad distribution of economic benefits across the citizen population of the country. Those benefits include government jobs, free health care and education, and heavily subsidized public utilities, all without taxes. These benefits have been provided directly by the state to its citizens, or perhaps better put, its subjects, bypassing historically mediating social actors such as tribal sheikhs, local notables, business communities, and the like, thus reducing the independent power of those elites and subordinating them to the Al Saud government. Although those elites have developed their own, have been have received their own benefits for, the, uh, for their participation in this system. The Saudi regime has maintained this generalized system of benefits even during periods of oil revenue declines, most notably from the early to mid-1980s through the late 1990s, by drawing down the state's financial reserves and by borrowing money, mostly on the domestic market. By the late 1990s, the government debt to GDP ratio of Saudi Arabia was well over 100%. And the regime was saved from fiscal crisis by the upturn in oil prices in the 2000s. 
The importance of these generalized benefits was apparent in Riyadh's reaction to the Arab Spring, where King Abdullah committed to spending uh, around $130 billion on his subjects, much of it immediately. So oil wealth, has, oil wealth not only was spread generally to the population, but it's also allowed the Saudi regime to build patron-client relations with specific social groups, vesting their interest in the continuation of the political status quo. The Saudi business community became highly dependent upon the state for contracts, licenses, credit, investment opportunities, subsidies, favorable labor regulations, and the creation of a national market. Given the enormous increase in the wealth of the country, the regime was able to create new merchant families, new business actors, among its core constituency and niche, even while it was continuing to patronize the existing merchant families in the Hejaz and in the eastern province. The business community, including in the Shia areas of the Qimir, have been supportive of the regime through the various crises it has faced since the oil revolution of the 1970s. Another important social group patronized by the Saudis has been the religious establishment. That relationship long predates the oil revolution, of course, but the coming of great oil wealth changed its dynamic. When the Saudi state was living hand to mouth, the Wahhabi men of religion served as the regime's bureaucrats, collecting its taxes and enforcing its law. With oil money in the post-World War II era, the regime began to build a modern bureaucracy staffed with a broader range of cells. The men of religion themselves became bureaucratized, just another set of state employees. <coughs> the power relationship, more equal in the past, became one of subordination of the religious establishment. But in exchange, the men of religion were given a significant cut of the vastly expanded state budget and allowed to build their own bureaucracies in various ministries and institutions. In exchange, they gave the al Saud their loyalty legitimating every controversial decision the regime made and supporting it against its critics, both domestic and foreign. Now, this change in the status of the religious establishment did not sit well with everyone in the country. The Saudis joining Al-Qaeda and the Islamic State are voting with their feet against the regime. More interesting than these extremists, however, for me, are the domestic critics of the regime from within the Salafi Wahhabi order. The awakening movement, the Sahwa, of religious critique against the regime developed in the 1980s, emerged with public criticism of Saudi policy in the Gulf War in the early 1990s, and felt the wrath of the state in that decade. But after the 9-11 attacks and the global criticism those attacks occasioned upon the regime and its version of Islam, its official version of Islam, the leaders of this movement publicly supported the Al Saud. They could not imagine an Arabia without Al Saud rule because Al Saud rule and Wahhabism were inextricably linked for them. While critics of regime policies, they too, when the chips were down, acted as clients and supporters of the regime. Now, oil wealth provided the Saudis with plenty of carrots, but also plenty of sticks, and we can't ignore that. The strategy of regime survival was not all benefits. The Saudi regime built an extensive set of security services aimed at maintaining domestic order, vastly expanding the interior ministry and its various policing services, both public and secret, the development of the National Guard as an alternative to the regular military. These domestic security services allowed the Saudis to put down, at times brutally, challenges to their rule domestically. Now, this is not to argue that the Saudi internal security forces are more efficient, brutal, or frightening than those of other Arab states. It's hard to imagine that Saudis fear their police more than Tunisians, Egyptians, Libyans, or Syrians fear theirs. But it would be equally mistaken to overlook the agencies of coercion and surveillance that oil money has allowed the Saudi regime to build. Institution, I'm sorry, institutions of distribution and of coercion are essential elements of the Saudi regime's security strategy, but so is a unique institution of governance, the ruling family itself. Oil money allowed the remaking of the family into an institution of rule. In more penurious circumstances, monarchs need to cut their extended family out of politics because they can't afford to employ them. 
But with the oil boom, the Al Saud were able to cut most, if not all, of the large number of sons of the founding came in on the spoils. The extended Al Saud family, or at least its senior members, formed a corporate group that ruled the country, particularly after the accession of King Faisal with the deposition of his half-brother, King Saud, in 1964. King Salman is, in all probability, the last of that generation to assume the top spot. The Al Saud formed themselves into a ruling elite, and since the Saud Faisal struggle, have basically maintained their internal loyalty and their internal unity. That unity has allowed them to fend off domestic challenges and confront regional crises in a coherent fashion and has prevented outside powers and local actors from being able to play off factions within the family against each other. Regime security requires that the ruling elite remain united, and the al Saud have. Generalized benefits to the citizenry, targeted patron-client relations with the business community, the religious establishment, tribal groups, institutions of coercion and surveillance, and the conversion of the ruling family into a corporate ruling elite have all been parts of the survival strategy of the al Saud regime at the domestic level. In terms of foreign policy, the major element of the re regime's survival strategy has been an alliance with the United States. Now, that alliance has been problematic at times, and we don't need to rehearse that history in front of an audience that knows that history well. But despite all those issues, the alliance has endured. It proved its worth to the Saudis most directly during the Gulf War, when the United States led an international coalition that ejected Saddam Hussein from Kuwait and restored the monarchical status quo. So given all that, are we seeing a change in the regime security strategy now? Well, with the accession of King Salman to leadership in Saudi Arabia in early 2015, every element of the regime's security strategy has come under pressure. The collapse of oil prices in late 2014 has called into question the ability of the state to sustain the government spending that underpins so much of this strategy. The changes in Saudi political economy promoted by the King's young son, Defense Minister and Deputy Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman, through the Vision 2030 plan, call into question some of the pillars of this strategy. The concentration of power in the hands of Prince Mohammed bin Salman and to a lesser extent in the hands of Crown Prince Mohammed bin Nayef suggests a new dispensation within the ruling family itself that raises questions about family unity going forward. Belief in Riyadh that the United States is withdrawing from its military role in the Middle East has cast into doubt the core foreign alliance of the re regime's survival strategy. Now an examination of each of these issues in more detail will demonstrate that the al Saud are not facing immediate challenges to regime stability. Taken together, however, they do suggest that Riyadh might, might, and I stress the word might here, might be contemplating a rewriting of the regime's survival strategy that has served it so well in the past decades. Now, the key challenge here facing the Saudi regime is fiscal. Even with spending cuts in 2015 and 2016, the IMF estimates that Saudi Arabia needs a oil price of $67 to balance its 2016 budget, and it's not getting that. The Saudi reaction to the Arab uprisings of 2011 emphasized the importance of state spending and patronage to the Saudi regime security strategy. As oil seems to be, seems to be settling into a moderate price range for the foreseeable future, Riyadh faces hard choices about how to cope. The past model was to maintain spending, run down reserves, and borrow. There has certainly been some of that so far. The 2015 government budget, which is the last budget we have closing figures for, we'll get the closing figures for the 2016 budget in, in three or four weeks. But the 2015 government budget was overspent by almost 20%. It was overspent by over 20% at a time when the regime said it was trying to economize. Saudi government financial reserves are estimated to have fallen 
uh, by almost one third from the end of 2014 to the upcoming end of 2016. Government debt to domestic entities has risen from below 2% of GDP to almost 12% of GDP by the end of this calendar year. In October of 2016, the government went for the first time to international markets for a, uh, a $17.5 billion <laughs> bond sale, the largest ever by an emerging market country. There are also indications that the government is using tactics similar to those of the oil price downturn of the 80s and 90s to preserve cash, such as delaying payments to contractors. So to some extent, this is an indication that the Saudis are going back to the old strategy, maintain spending by borrowing right, and economizing by not paying their bills. However, there are also strong indications that King Salman and Prince Mohammed bin Salman are rethinking the distributional basis of the regime's survival strategy. In the Prince's plan for economic restructuring, subsidies on, elect on electricity and water are to be cut, a value-added tax is to be implemented, and, a number of, and the number of public sector jobs is not to be frozen, but to be reduced. The private sector is expected to take on the bulk of the responsibility for employing Saudis entering the workforce. Saudi electricity and water bills are already going up. And in September 2016, salaries and perks for government employees were cut. It's not clear how the government intends to push the Saudi private sector, whose business model is largely based on cheap foreign labor, to absorb so much greater a percentage of local job seekers. But it is clear that the implementation of Prince Mohammed's plans will require sacrifices, not only from the mass of the Saudi public, but also from the Saudi business community. Moreover, the Vision 2030 document envisages an increase in public entertainments in the country of a type opposed in the past by the religious establishment, concerts, movies, a more active social life in general. The state has already taken, step, taken steps under King Salman to restrict the powers of the religious police. Now, the ambitious plans laid out in Vision 2030 and in the National Transformation Program documents call into question the patron-client relationships that the Saudi regime has built over time with the general population, the Saudi business community, and to a lesser extent, the religious establishment. Now, it's entirely possible that seeing the dangers of profound changes in the country's political economy, the regime will back away and trust to the fates and to the oil market to allow them to sustain themselves. But this round of economic changes seems more serious than previous past announcements of similar changes, both because initial steps have been taken and because they have behind them the political will of the leading decision makers. King Salman has also made an important change in another institution that is an element of the Saudi regime's security strategy, the ruling family itself. The al Saud have ruled the country as a corporate body for decades. This dynastic monarchy model, to use Michael Herb's term, kept the regime in power through numerous regional crises and internal challenges. King Salman, most likely the last of these senior princes, who sided with Faisal in the struggle with King Saud in the late 50s and early 60s, has upended that system of shared governance in his transfer of power to the next generation. Rather than recreate a system of senior princes in the next generation, he has concentrated power in the hands of two princes from that group, the Crown Prince and the Deputy Crown Prince. There are now fewer members of the Al Saud family in the current Saudi cabinet than at any time since King Faisal became king. This concentration of power has permitted more decisive and risky decision making exemplified both by Vision 2030 and by the Yemen War, both policies directed by and strongly identified with Prince Mohammed and Salman. Now the risk in this shift in the structure of power within the ruling family is that it will be rejected by other members of the family, creating rifts within the ruling elite and opening up the possibility of conflicts over power. There have been indications of disquiet within the family but these faint public signals of discontent have been few and far between. 
there are no indications of an overt split within the family that could lead to a real power struggle. But that possibility remains. It would be hard to argue that King Salman has changed the major foreign policy pillar of the al Saud regime security strategy, which is the relationship with the United States. Washington and Riyadh continue to cooperate on a range of issues, including intelligence sharing and counterterrorism. The United States continues to sell substantial amounts of weaponry to Saudi Arabia and has provided vital logistical support to the Saudi military operation in Yemen. But it is undoubtedly true that the Saudi leadership has less confidence in American security guarantees than has been the case in the past. While the Saudis saw the spread of Iranian power throughout the region as the major security threat to be faced, the United States has focused on ISIS and Salafi jihadism as its primary target, while seeking to draw Iran into a new relationship. This uncertainty about the United States' willingness to play a major military role in the region has led Saudi foreign policy under King Salman to take greater risks, most notably in Yemen. But the departure that the Yemen campaign represents in Saudi foreign policy can be exaggerated. The Saudis are not deploying significant ground forces into Yemen. They seem to be looking for a political settlement to the fighting supporting various mediation efforts through 2016, although they've all failed. Their involvement in the Syrian civil war is through the means that Saudi Arabia has used for decades to try to affect regional politics. Money and guns to local clients, media and propaganda support for its side, diplomatic pressure regionally and internationally to achieve its aims. Yet there is a general sense that Saudi Arabia is taking a more activist role in regional politics, confronting Iran, and using military force directly in Yemen to secure its interests. The Saudi sense of uncertainty about the American security commitment is not simply a factor of their distaste for the Obama administration, although that distaste is real and significant. The substantial increase in American domestic oil production has raised questions about the importance of Persian Gulf oil in overall American strategy, both in the US and in Saudi Arabia itself. Now, I think these questions are misplaced. The Saudi-American relationship was forged when the US did not import one single drop of oil from anywhere. It was the importance of the Gulf region for world energy supplies that led American defense planners and strategic thinkers to identify it as a strategic cross. That global importance has not lessened, even with the ups and downs of the world oil market. However, perceptions are central to policy, and many on both sides of the relationship wonder if the most recent changes in the oil market have decreased the importance of the, of the Gulf region for American strategy. One can see some of that reflected in recent congressional actions, including the joint uh, the Justice Against Sponsors of Terrorism Act, JASTA, that was very much directed against Saudi Arabia, received enormous support in both the Senate and the House. It was vetoed by President Obama, and that veto was overridden by enormous majorities in both houses of Congress, bipartisan majorities in both houses of Congress. So in conclusion, what can we say? Is the regime security strategy of the al Saud changing? Well, it's too early to give a definitive answer to that question. As I said, I think it would be wrong to extrapolate from the adventure in Yemen to say that there's been a profound change in Saudi regional strategy. Because when I look at Syria, I don't see a profound change in Saudi strategy. I see a continuity in the means that Saudi Arabia has used in the past. None of the domestic trends, the domestic policy trends that I talked about earlier are irreversible. The regime could back away from the more serious changes set out in Vision 2030 and return to a policy of bar borrowing and hoping for change in the world oil market. The recent negotiations among OPEC and non-OPEC producers that have produced the agreement on production cuts is not a new strategy. That's an old strategy that Saudi Arabia has used in the past. There could be changes in the ruling family particularly if King Salman's rule ends shortly, that could clip the wings of the young deputy crown prince and return the more cautious structure 
of committee rule by senior princes. The Saudi-American relationship has weathered plenty of crises in the past, and it could weather this one as well. But for the first time since King Faisal consolidated power in the mid-1960s, one can entertain the question in a serious way of whether the al Saud are rethinking the strategies that have kept them in power. For the first time since the oil revolution in the early 1970s, there are serious plans being implemented in Riyadh to change the political economy of the distributive rentier oil state. The structure of power within the ruling family is undergoing an important change. The relationship with the United States is being called to question on both sides in a serious way. I would not hazard a guess as to the ultimate destination of these changes, but if they are carried forward, and that is a big if, the Al Saud will need to develop new strategies and new mechanisms to sustain support within their society and in the international community. Thank you.